Chapter 3, Resources and Living Things What does this macaw chick need to survive? Our big question is, how do Earth's people, how do people use Earth's resources? Since people aren't the only living things that need resources to survive, how we use our plant's resources has an impact on all of Earth's species. Small and helpless, this baby scarlet macaw cannot live on its own. This chick was born featherless and with its eyes closed. Macaw parents feed the chick until it is at least three months old. It says to infer, what basic things does this chick need to survive? Hmm, well I know the chick is a biotic thing so it's living, so it needs pretty much what all living things need to survive. So probably food, shelter, water, protection from those who are trying to eat it. Our big question remember is how do people use Earth's resources? That's what we'll be unlocking throughout these chapters. Lesson 1, Introduction to Environmental Issues. After this lesson, we'll be able to identify the general categories of environmental issues and describe how decision makers balance opposing needs and concerns. My Planet Diary. How do you feel about nature? You probably have heard of scientists who study animals, plants, rocks, and everything else in an ecosystem. Social scientists study an often overlooked but very important part of an ecosystem, the people who use it. These scientists study how people value nature. They study how much people would be willing to pay to preserve nature. They also study how different age groups, genders, races, and social groups use nature. For example, example. A scuba diver wants coral reefs to remain beautiful and full of all kinds of organisms to enjoy in future dives. A commercial fisherman cares more about a coral reef supporting the kind of fish he wants to catch. You might care about coral reefs because you want to visit one someday. So a question to be thinking about is do you think it is important to consider how people value nature? Hmm. So think about this, this will be a question on your worksheet. What are the types of environmental issues? Here's a riddle for you. What place is bigger than the United States and Mexico combined? This place is covered with ice more than two kilometers thick. It is a habitat for many animals and is a source of oil, coal, and iron. Stumped? The answer is Antarctica. Some people think of Antarctica as a useless, icy wasteland, but there are unique wildlife habitats in Antarctica. There are also valuable minerals beneath its thick ice. What is the best use of Antarctica? Many people want access to its rich deposits of mineral and oil. Others worry that mining will harm its delicate ecosystems. Some people propose building hotels, parks, and ski resorts. Others think that Antarctica should remain undeveloped. Who should decide Antarctica's fate? In 1998, 26 nations agreed to ban mining and oil exploration in Antarctica for at least 50 years. As resources become more scarce elsewhere in the world, the debate will surely continue. Antarctica's future is just one environmental issue that people have faced today. Environmental issues fall into three general categories. Population growth, resource use, and pollution. Because these three types of issues are interconnected, they are very difficult to study and resolve. So here it says some people want to leave Antarctica wild, but others want it developed. So they said to fill in the boxes with points outlining each argument. So argument one is we're going to keep Antarctica wild. Well, some points outlining why they should keep that. Well, we have the unique wildlife and habitats. We can say building resorts would be expensive. It would cost a lot of money. Uh, the 
Antarctica's weather conditions aren't awesome, so you probably don't even want to go to Antarctica to go on a ski resort. Argument two is develop Antarctica. So, hmm. Well, there's oil and mineral deposits. You could get money from building hotels, resorts, and attractions. So even though it would cost money to build them, you'd probably get a bunch of people who want to go. And it could provide some jobs. Hmm. Recall that we said that environmental issues fall into three general categories. We have population growth, resource use, and pollution. So now we're going to talk more about these three things. The human population grew very slowly until about A.D. 1650. Around that time, improvements in medicine, agriculture, and waste disposal led to people's living longer. The human population has been growing faster and faster since then. When a population grows, the demand for resources also grows. Has your town or city ever experienced a water shortage? If so, you might have noticed that people have been asked to restrict their water use. This sometimes happens in areas with fast-growing populations. The water supplies in such areas were designed to serve fewer people than they do now, so shortages can occur during unusually dry weather. Resource Use Earth provides many materials people use throughout their lives. Anything that occurs naturally in the environment is used by people is called a natural resource. Natural resources include trees, water, oil, coal, and other things. However, people do not use resources in the same way. In some areas of the world, people use a wide variety of resources. In other areas, people may have little or no access to certain natural resources. For example, people in Central Asia live too far away from ocean waters that provide fish and other resources. Conflict arises when a natural resource is scarce or used in a way that people feel is unfair. Seems about right. At the very bottom we have a My Resources Journal. It says, we use natural resources many times a day without even realizing it. A trip to the beach uses land, water, fuel, and many other resources, although hopefully we're not making any trips to the beach right now. On the journal page, list all the ways you have used natural resources today. For example, this book, even though you don't have a book in front of you, I'm reading out of my book. It's made of paper that started as a tree. So I can say from my resource journal, which would probably be different than yours, well, my science book, some of the foods I had for lunch today. Um, I took a shower this morning and so the water I used for my shower. But also I'm drinking water right next to me and my water bottle next to me. So I'm using water in multiple ways. Um, I didn't drive anywhere today but my mom did so she used gas. I wrote stuff down with a pencil today and that it was made from wood. My clothes, I think, are made from cotton. I could be wrong, could be polyester. But either way, they're made. Our third one is pollution. Many environmental factors can contribute to less than ideal conditions on Earth for people or other organisms. The contamination of Earth's land, water, or air is called pollution. Pollution can be caused by wastes, chemicals, noise, heat, light, and other sources. Pollution can destroy wildlife and cause human health problems. So sometimes it's super bad, like air pollution and water pollution um, that is brought by wastes, so like sludge and stuff coming out of factories. But sometimes they're talking about like noise pollution, meaning that there's just so much noise. So if you recall, if you read, um, Phantom Tollbooth, when they went to the Valley of Sound, but they got silence, there was too much noise. It was, there was a lot of noise pollution, and so she just got rid of it. She said, nope, I don't want any more noise. 
pollution is usually related to population growth and resource use. As you probably know, the burning of gasoline releases pollutants into the air. With more cars on the road, more gasoline is used, so more pollutants are released into the air. As populations grow and more people need to be fed, more fertilizers and other chemicals may be used to produce that food. As these chemicals run off the land, they can pollute bodies of water. Pollution sources can be grouped into two categories. A point source is a specific pollution source that can be identified. A pipe gushing polluted water into a river is an example of a point source. A non-point source of pollution is not as easy to identify. A non-point source is widely spread and cannot be tied to a specific or origin. For example, the polluted air that can hang over urban areas comes from vehicles, factories, and other polluters. The pollution cannot be tied to any one car or factory. So we know if we have our factory and it's spewing out sludge and it's the only factory in the area and the waters have sludge, well, that's a point source. We know that sludge came from that factory and we can fix it. A non-point source is if you're driving in a really big city and you see kind of a fog, like a haze, but it smells really bad. It's not actually fog. It's pollution coming from the gas in your cars that's coming out of the back of your car. Um, it's, coming from, it's coming from those factories any other ways that it would be plugged in there. So we can't narrow it down and say, aha, it's Miss McDonald's car that's causing the pollution. We can't say that, we don't know. It's probably a part of the pollution, but it's not one way that we can fix it. Hopefully that makes sense. Anyway, what is a natural resource? We're in the assess your understanding. What is a natural resource? Did you say a natural resource is anything that occurs naturally in the environment and is used by people? In those exact words, then you're correct. Hmm. How is population growth related to the resource use and pollution? Well, if population grows, the amount of resources people use will grow and the more pollution is going to be caused. Hmm. So if there's more people, more people are going to be getting cars. Those cars are made out of material and are, are, are resources. And also they use gas. That's a natural resource. And then more cars on the road means more pollution in the air. Quite a bummer. Too many people, too much pollution. Okay, but like, how are environmental decisions made? Dealing with environmental issues means making decisions. Decisions can be made at many levels. Your decision to walk to your friend's house rather than ride in the car is made at a personal level. Stay home though. A town's decision about how to dispose of its trash is, trash is made at a local level. A decision about whether the United States should allow oil drilling in a wildlife refuge is made on a national level. Decisions about how to protect Earth's atmosphere are made on a global level. Your personal decisions have a small impact, but when the personal decisions of millions of people are combined, they have a huge impact on the environment. Here's what I mean by that. Right now, we are in our global, so worldwide, pandemic. Everybody, mostly, is following the rules around the world and staying home. Because everybody have made that personal level decision, I have made personally the decision to stay home and not go out and hang out with my friends and drive my car around all day every day. The air is starting to become cleaner. You can see that dolphins, I've heard, are returning to Italy. What? How do dolphins even get to Italy? I don't understand. But the water in Italy is getting clearer because nobody is using the factories and things that are polluting the water. So they've made a small personal decision 
that literally was created on a national level and it's affecting the globe. It's affecting the environment. Okay. Lawmakers work with many groups to make environmental decisions. One such group is an environmental scientist. Environmental science is the study of natural processes in the environment and how humans can affect them. Data provided by environmental scientists are only part of the decision-making process. Environmental decision-making requires a balance between the needs of the environment and the needs of people. To help balance the different opinions on an environmental issue, decision makers weigh the costs and benefits of proposal for a change before making a decision. Apply it! Suppose you're a member of a city planning board. A company wants to buy a piece of land outside the city and build a factory on it. When you go into work one day, you are met by protesters demanding the land be turned into a wildlife park. Hmm. Number one says solve problems. How should you decide what to do with the land? Now this question is not asking which do you choose? It's asking how are you going to decide what to choose? I'd say probably I'm going to have to weigh the costs and benefits of both proposals. I need to know which side best meets the need of the people and the environment. Cost and benefit, remember, is saying what are you what are you getting and what are you leaving behind? So you purchased something, but what did you not get? What's the pros and cons kind of? So, okay, I have two sides. I need to figure out the pros and cons. I need the, the costs and the benefits. What are some ways we could find out the opinions of people about this issue? Well, we could hold public meetings, provided we weren't in lockdown. We could Zoom call, have an internet campaign, set out a poll on the ballots. We could probably write down when people go voting they could circle in what the what do they want to do should we do this or this should we build a factory or make a wildlife park we could stand out on the streets sometimes you might see people on streets and they're like hi i'm an environmental person and i want you to love our earth and sometimes people will stop and listen and they'll say oh yeah i agree with you here's my name i'll sign your petition and hopefully that the side that I want wins. Costs and benefits are often economic. Will the proposal provide jobs? Will it cost too much money? Costs and benefits are not measured only in terms of money. For example, suppose a state must decide whether to allow logging in a certain area. Removing trees changes the ecosystem, which is an ecological cost. However, the wood and jobs provided by the logging are economic benefits. It's also important to consider the short-term and long-term costs and benefits of an environmental decision. A plan's short-term costs might be outweighed by its long-term benefits. So like going back to earlier we're talking about Antarctica, a short-term cost would be how much money we would be spending to build resorts in Antarctica. But a long-term benefit from that would could be all the money we're getting in. So we might spend $2 million building a resort, but we might get $8 million because people were coming and wanting to go move here, wanting to go to the resorts. So that actually is it. That's all I've got for you. Unless you fancy um, writing a letter to your senator, but I don't fancy writing a letter to my senator about offshore drilling, so I shan't. Um, so that's it. I will see you on Thursday for our next lesson in science. You can go work on your worksheet now. Goodbye!